Hollywood, California, Monday, June 7th. The Lux Radio Theater presents Errol Finn and Francis Farmer in British Agent. Lux presents Hollywood. We want to thank all of you for your regular purchases of Lux Flakes. It is this loyalty that makes possible the Lux Radio Theater. Tonight, our stars are Errol Flynn and Francis Farmer. Our guests, Dolly Tree, noted costume designer of Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer Studios, and Natalie Bucknell, head of Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer's research department and former secret agent. This program was produced each week by Hollywood's distinguished director, Cecil B. DeMille, with Louis Silvers conducting, direct from our theater on Hollywood Boulevard. May we take this opportunity to say once again, Welcome, everyone, to the Lux Radio Theater. Before starting our play, I have a letter here that is typical of the mail that comes to us here in Hollywood or is forwarded to us from our different stations. Miss Harriet Rumsey of Alton, Illinois, in her enthusiasm for our product and our show, writes as follows. Most women realize that they owe a debt of gratitude to Lux Flakes. They know that their stockings, their silk things, their woolens are preserved by Lux Care. Now the American public has another cause to be grateful to Lux. Your radio hour is a great contribution. Monday is a red letter day in our family because of the Lux Radio Theater. Lux appreciates your kind words very much, Miss Rumsey. It's the loyalty of our big Lux family that makes it possible for us to give you the kind of show we want you to have. So every time you order Lux, and by the way, the big box is most convenient, just remember you are contributing to the success of the Lux Radio Theater and such plays as we give you tonight under the direction of Cecil B. DeMille. And now, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Cecil B. DeMille. Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. Errol Flynn's early career was charted with a compass. He came to Hollywood through the tropic tempests of the South Seas, where he was captain of a trading schooner, while Francis Farmer, who hails from Seattle, arrived here by way of Russia. A descendant of Fletcher Christian, who led the mutiny on the bounty, Errol has been an officer in charge of native constabulary, a pearl and coral fisher, a beachcomber, and a member of England's boxing team in the 1928 Olympics. For a time in Australia, he was also a bottle smeller. This odd pursuit consisted of whiffing bottles to see if any odors remained after washing. Once he led a film, exp uh, a, a film expedition to the land of New Guinea. The natives were headhunters, but they shot Errol in the ankle. Returning to New Guinea to dig for gold, he made a small fortune, quickly spent it, bought a boat, and with three friends duplicated the voyage made by Captain Bly of the Bounty up the inner passage of the Great Barrier Reef from Sydney to the South Seas. Back in Australia... Errol had his first taste of picture acting, made a second film in England, and was soon on Warner Brothers' payroll. He has written one book and many short stories. He's here tonight in the part of Stephen Locke. Frances Farmer developed her talent for acting while a student at the University of Washington, where she helped pay her way by ushering in a theater, tutoring, waiting on table, and working in a department store. To her great surprise, she won a contest sponsored by a Seattle newspaper, the, tribe, the, the prize being a trip to Russia. On the way back, she met a theatrical producer who introduced her to a film executive in New York. Frances made her screen test, won a contract, and returned home a Paramount player. Her next picture is exclusive, and we hear her tonight as Elenia. Our play is based on the Warner Brothers film suggested by Bruce Lockhart's best-selling autobiography of the same title. So up goes our coast-to-coast -coast curtain, and the Lux Radio Theater presents British Agent, starring Errol Flynn and Frances Farmer. City of Petrograd. The dawn of the Russian Revolution, October 1917. From the steps of the British Embassy in Petrograd, a young man watches the mounting fury of the Russian Civil War. A screaming, hysterical mob sweeps through the streets, driven on by the lashing whips of the mounted police. Suddenly, a girl breaks from the crowd 
comes stumbling through the shrubbery. She falls to her knees. The young man darts from the steps and catches her in his arms. Steady there. Let me go. Please. It's all right. I'm not going to hurt you. Where are you running to? The police. They are chasing me. Let me go. Well, you're safe here. Look. Get behind that hedge. Stay come. Stay come. Don't move. What are you doing in here? I am of the police. That woman. She shoot at me. My arm. Well, you've no right in these grounds. This is the British Embassy. British territory, do you understand? Now get I, out. I take her. She shoot me. Did you, you hear me? This is British territory. Get out, I said. Well, it's all right now. He's gone. Thank you. I am quite sure you saved my life. Tough customer, wasn't he? Still, you can't blame him for being a bit annoyed, you know. After all, you did take a shot at him. He deserved it. Well, he got it. Well, I had better go. After all, I am trespassing on British territory, too. Well, you can't go out there until this row blows over. Blows over? This is not just a street riot. It is the revolution. Tomorrow, the red government will be in power. Oh, ho. And the day after that, the white, eh? Then the green, and so on. Perhaps you do not know a great deal about it, eh? Well, perhaps not, but I'm trying to. Oh, uh, perhaps we should introduce ourselves. My name's Locke, Stephen Locke, British Embassy. How do you do? Fine, thank you. And you? Forgive me, but I am keeping you out here in the cold. Had not you better go in before you get pneumonia? Oh, I risk the cold. But, well, I suppose I'd better go in and let them know I'm still alive. Look, you can slip out the side gate there. It's clear now. Thank you. Good night. Good luck. Mr. Locke, I'm glad you've come in, sir. I was beginning to worry about you. Oh, were you? Thanks, Evans. Sir Walter has been asking for you. He wants to see you at once, sir. Oh, right. In the library? Yes, sir. Evening, Sir Walter. Uh, oh, oh, Locke. Uh, oh, yes, yes. Come in, come in. Evans said you wanted to see me, sir. Yes, sit down, Locke. Nasty business, this. The revolution? Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. From all indications, the Russian government will fall before the week is out. It places us in a rather uncomfortable position, Locke. I might even say a precarious position. Yes, quite so. If and when the government falls, we have orders from London to close the embassy. Close the embassy? Yes, move out. Bag and baggage back to England. Whew, I see. However, we plan to leave someone behind. Someone who understands the situation here. And who will act as a sort of unofficial observer. Well, sir? I have recommended you. Oh. Well, thank you, sir. I thought I'd let you know a little beforehand. That'll give you plenty of time to make plans. Yes, just what will my duties be, sir? Well, frankly, I'm not quite sure. But you'll be informed in time, though. But whatever they are, my boy, you'll need your wits about you every minute of the day and night. Now, you'll be alone here, entirely on your own. It won't be an easy job. It may be a dangerous one. Do you still want it? Well, never, sir. Good boy. We'll have a long talk before I leave. Russian government crumbles. Lenin heads new Russian state. Government he flees new Russian state. Bolsheviks in power, paper. Lenin seeks separate peace with Germany. French, Italian, British embassies closed. British embassy closed. Lord, and don't I know it. Evans, this place is like a tomb. Can't we get some heat in here? Yes, sir. I'll see to it, sir. No message from England yet? Not a word, sir. Will you have your tea now, sir? Well, yes, thanks. I may as well have something to do, I suppose. Oh, uh, Mr. Tita Del Valle of the Italian Legation called, sir. He wanted to know if you dined this evening with Monsieur Lafarge and Mr. Medill of the American Red Cross. <laughs> Del Valle, Lafarge. Medill and Locke. The four lost souls of Russia. The only one who knows why he's here is Medill. And he's not sure. Oh, uh, I said you'd go with them, sir. The Gypsy Cafe. It will rest your nerve. You have been a bit jumpy, sir, the last few weeks. Well, why wouldn't I be jumpy? It's enough to give a man the jitters sitting here day after day doing nothing when everybody else in the world is either fighting or working for his country. God, they even let old ladies knit socks. Listen to that. For days they've been going by, Russian soldiers back from the front. Every one of them that leaves makes England's position that much weaker. All I can do is stand in a window and watch them go by. They also, sir, who stand and wait. Wait? Wait for what? Your tea, sir. Oh, oh, yes. Thanks, Evans. <laughs> 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 
Come on, cheer up, Locke. You've got a face a yard long. It can't be as bad as that. Sorry, madam. Well, look at me. In the same boat as you, Stefan. Boat, Tito, boat. <laughs> oh, in the same boat, yes. Waiting for word from my home office. And Lefarge here, too. Oh, me? I only wait for a visa on my passport. Well, I'd like to know who's going to do it for you. There's no one left here. Oh, looking for someone, Locke? No, I was looking at someone. I say, wait a bit, will you? You fellas, back in a few minutes. Uh-huh, you see? That girl who just came in. He is going to speak to her. He knows her, maybe, eh? I wonder if he knows the man who came in with her. Why? Who is the man? Pavlov, head of the Chaka, the Russian secret police. Mm, I have heard of that one. Who hasn't? Well, how do you do? Oh, the Englishman. Yes, the lady of the garden. Eh? Oh, you remember me. Oh, uh, this is Mr. Pavlov. Uh, Pavlov, Mr. Mr. Stephen Locke, is it not? Yes, how do you do, sir? I don't seem to recall where we met. No, we've never met. You will excuse me a moment, please. There's someone over there I must speak with. Yes, of course. Thank you. Sit down, Mr. Locke. Tell me, did you uh, catch cold that night? Well, I sneezed once and then decided against it. You see, with your revolution going on, I didn't know if I'd ever get my handkerchiefs back from the laundry. <laughs> and I thought you had gone back to England with the others. Oh, no. The embassy left in such a hurry, they forgot me and one old umbrella. Do you come here often? Every night. I sit in the embassy all day and here every night. But haven't you anything to do? Not a blessed thing. My orders were to consider myself embalmed. You know, I've been sitting for the last month watching you Russians negotiating for a separate peace. Not making a move, not even presenting an argument against it. And why should you? Suppose England were in a war where she had more men mobilized than any other nation on either side as Russia has. More than the United States and England put together. And suppose Englishmen were fighting with shells filled with sawdust. And suppose England's mortality rate was higher than any of the other nations as Russia's is. You put England in Russia's place. What would you want England to do? Just exactly what England would do. Keep right on fighting. Exactly. Committing stupid murder and calling it English idealism. We have ideals in England, And you know. so have we. But at least I am fighting for ours. I see. And I sit safely in the embassy, letting others fight for me, eh? Oh, I did not mean it that way. Oh, I know. You know, I'm getting as touchy on this subject as an old maiden lady about her pies. Forgive me, will you? I've been sitting down and vigorously doing nothing for so long, it's getting on my nerves. Look, let's get out of here and get some air, can we? I'm even sick of the smell of this place. Oh, I would like to, but... But, Pablo... Oh, yes, that's right. We will go anyway. Come on, we will have to hurry. I do not want to explain. Are we going someplace in particular? No, just driving. Where? Well, what's the difference? We can't go far enough to get out of Russia. If I had a job in a country I did not like, do you know what I would do? Go home? Yes. So would I. But suppose you had a job in a country you did like, and you were anxious to keep it from making a mistake, but your hands were tied. Then what would you do? I would be very grateful they were tied so that they could not meddle in other people's business. And I would try to forget it by talking of something else. Oh, home. Well, what, for instance? The moon up there? Oh, I think not. Stars? No. Music? No. Us? No. Yes. Why are you stopping? Well, I can't drive and kiss you at the same time. You should not have done that. I suppose you think me a little presumptuous, eh? A little. But at least it served to change the subject. Oh, ho, oh, oh. ho. So you're bored, No, eh? but I am cold. Take me home, please. But I'll see you again. May I? You, you want to? Yes. Tomorrow? So soon. Wish we could make it sooner. Tomorrow's a long time. More coffee? Lynn? Thank you. Oh, I really should be going. It is very late. Oh, no, not yet. Stay and cheer me up. Oh, you're not very flattering. I have been here all evening, and now you want cheering up. Oh, that's just an excuse. I don't know what I'd have done without you these last few days. Thank you. Why do you look at me like that? You know, Elena, if I were a sculptor, I'd model a head of you and call it Joan of Arc. 
You have that kind of beauty. I think I'd rather you standing... Oh, no, I wouldn't. Why, to think of you as Joan of Arc would be to think of losing you as a martyr and not keeping you as a woman. I think you are a little mad, Stefan. Think so? I do not understand you. Well, for the first time in my life, I don't understand myself. I think I'm in love with you, Elena. Well, that is impossible. Is it? Oh, please do not. Let me go, Stefan. Afraid? Yes. With me? No, no, for us. That kiss would be the beginning of something that we would both regret. Would you regret loving people? Yes. When you know you have to part. But must we part? Oh, you know we must. Our lives are devoted to following two ideals, Stefan, leading us in opposite directions. That means that sooner or later we must, must say goodbye. But Elena, if I weren't English and you weren't Russian, that'd make a difference, wouldn't it? Yes. And can't we pretend, then? Pretend? Yes, that there's no war, no revolution. That we're just two people, unattached and free. Free to love each other, if we wanted to. Oh, Mr. Father. You do want to. You do, don't you, Elena? So much. Darling. Who is it? I beg pardon, sir. May I see you a moment, please? Right. It's important. Excuse me, Elena. Of course. Well, Evans? Dispatch from London, sir. From London? Get my decoding book. Have it, sir. Right here, sir. Well, let's see now. His Majesty's government has appointed you unofficial representative. Unofficial representative in Russia. Unofficial? Now, what the blazes does that mean? Anyway, you've been appointed, sir. We look to you to do all in your power to prevent signing of a separate peace with Germany. This does not convey recognition of Russia, but commissions you to act only as an individual. We cannot be responsible for your safety or your decision, but await your recommendations. At last, Evans. It's wonderful, sir. It's the greatest diplomatic mission of the whole war. We've got to keep the Russians fighting on the Eastern Front. <laughs> How do you think I'll find the ambassadorial bed, Evans? It's a roomy thing, sir. A bit large, but comfortable. Evans, I appoint you Lord High Chancellor of the Bedchamber. Lord High Keeper of the Keys. Lord High, uh, well, Lord High, anything you like. In short, your Pooh Bar, Evans. Thank you, sir. I'll see the War Commission tomorrow. Talk them out of signing that peace treaty. This is the chance of a lifetime. But there's one thing. They mustn't know I'm unofficial. Oh, no, sir. Now, let's see you. Uh, oh, Lady, I'm sorry. Each is all right, I was just going. Well, I'll see you home. Oh, please do not bother. You must be busy. Well, I am rather, darling. You understand? Of course. Good night. Good night. I'll call you tomorrow. Yes. Please do, Stefan. Mr. Locke? Yes? You have just promised this commission England's trade and recognition, in return for which Russia is to continue supporting the Allied armies at the front. Exactly. Uh, tell us, Mr. Locke, on whose authority do you do this? Well, I represent England. You lie, Mr. Locke. You represent England only unofficially. Your purpose in coming here was to delay the making of a separate peace. You spoke well, but only expressed the opinion of one of England's many private citizens. Seems that you know something of my affairs, gentlemen. May I ask how you know? It is our business to know many things. You are excused, Mr. Locke. We advise you to leave Russia as soon as possible. One moment, please. Gentlemen... It's quite true, I am here only in an unofficial capacity. But allow me some time to communicate with London. What for? I'll tell my government that in return for your not opening peace negotiations, I've promised you immediate help. Money, ammunition, troops. My government will back me up, I know it. <laughs> well, gentlemen? We will allow you three weeks, Mr. Locke. 
We must be assured, however, that during that time, England will do nothing to hinder our government. I pledge England to that, sir. Send your communication. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. We shall keep our promise, Mr. Locke. Let us hope that you keep yours and those you have made for England. I think England's integrity is well known, sir. Good day, gentlemen. Remember, Mr. Locke? Three weeks. Well, sir, how did it come out? Oh, badly, Evans. They knew I was acting unofficially. They knew it? But how... Uh... Yes. Oh. That's how they knew it. She told them. Who's there? The fox. Oh, it's you. You said you would call. I, I had to come to see you. What for? Come to ingratiate yourself again so that you can betray another confidence? Oh, no, no. Don't deny it. You were here when that dispatch came. You overheard what I said. You told them. How else could they know? I had no intention of denying it, Stefa. It was my duty. Really? And I suppose last night when you... You said you loved me. That was all in the line of duty, too, was it? Last night was beautiful. So beautiful that what you said just now will not even spoil the memory of it. Goodbye, Stephen. Oh, no, wait, Elena. I'm sorry. I didn't mean what I said. Come here, darling. Oh, dearest. Poor foolish Elena. You believe so strongly in your ideals, don't you? Don't you see how wrong they are? But my ideal is peace. Peace and the happiness for Russia. You call that wrong? It must be wrong to let down one's friends. There must be loyalty between nations. This separate peace, it's, it's a rank betrayal. You mean that England will be inconvenienced because Russia refuses to share the burden of England's war? No, we're fighting for the world. Oh, you think your country is the world? Well, at any rate, we kept on fighting when the Russians threw down their guns and ran away like a lot of frightened dogs. Be quiet! Then you. Oh, Stefan. Why did I do that when I love you so? Darling, I suppose because we just aren't big enough to see over our ideals. Lenya. <laughs> Let's listen in for a moment now on a little girl and her mother. Patricia is seven, and she's been playing with her dolls while her mother is dressing for the afternoon. Mommy, what are you going to do? I was going to lux the things I was wearing this morning. Can I come with you? Well, of course, honey. That slip looks clean as clean. Why do you wash it? Well, I found it pays to lux things after every wearing. They stay pretty and new much longer that way. You see, dear, if I put them into the hamper, the perspiration dries in and it's apt to rot the thread. That's true of stockings, too. That's why Mother likes to lux things right after she takes them off. Oh, Mommy, I want to lux Dolly's things after you're through. It looks like such fun. Grown-ups, too, think it fun to lux things. It takes less than a minute to whisk up a nice froth of suds, swish things around a few times, and toss them into clear water. Less than a minute, mind you. And yet it keeps silks like new actually months longer. If you haven't a box of Lux handy to the bathroom wash bowl, make a note to get some tomorrow. And here again is Mr. DeMille. British Agent continues, starring Errol Flynn and Francis Farmer. <laughs> After promising help to the Russian government, Stephen waits to hear from his home office in London. Waits with growing anxiety for the official confirmation of his promises. It's late evening, near the end of his three weeks of grace. Alone in his study, Stephen paces the floor nervously. The door's flung open, and Elenia stands on the threshold. Elenia, you shouldn't have come here. With your car's watching me, they may suspect you. Something has happened, Stefa. I wanted to tell you, rather than have you humiliated by learning it from them. What are you talking about? British troops under General Poole landed on Russian soil this afternoon. Why, right, then. That's the answer to my telegram. I've won. No, no, Stefa. You have lost. What do you mean? 
They have come to fight against the revolution. But they, they couldn't do that. I promised it. It is true. I saw the official telegram. I mean... England betrayed you. This perfect country of yours, in spite of all its high ideals, ruined your career, humiliated you before the world. You see, it was you who were a little foolish, Stefan. Not a bit of it. One's either useful or one isn't. My career. What's that when men are dying by hundreds in the trenches every day? England hasn't let me down. I let her down. I knew the promises I made were lies. I just wanted to delay that separate piece, that's all. I, I never sent that telegram. Oh. You better go now. You'll only get in trouble being here. You will not see me again, Stefan. Not see you? The government is moving to Moscow, naturally. I go with it. We shall not see one another, Stefan, even in Moscow. You think more of your duty than you do of me, eh? Yes. And I worship you. That is why we must not go on together. It would kill the most beautiful thing I'll never know, our love. And I wanted to live. Oh, do not see me again, please. Goodbye, Stefan. Goodbye, Lane. Drop that grip right here, Evans. Yes, Mr. Locke. Open the windows, will you? It's stuffy. Yes, sir. Well, Pooba, make yourself at home, because this is it. That is, and, uh, until the checker asks me what the blazes I'm doing in Moscow. I might ask, sir. What are you doing here? <laughs> I'm not exactly certain. All I know is that the government's here. I have a hunch that if I can establish some sort of a contact with them, they might be coerced, wheedled, or tempted back into the war somehow. <laughs> That, 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 that was the doorbell, sir. Was it? That rather tinkling noise, do you mean? Uh, what, uh, uh, what do you suppose it means, sir? Well, probably someone wants to be let in. Uh, that must be it, sir. Welcome to Moscow, Evan. Mr. Madill and Monsieur Lafarge. Hello, Hello, good to see you. Oh, Hello, you Madill stay. Lafarge, Tito. <laughs> How did you know I was here? Oh, we have spies, eh? Sure, we've been here a week already. Well, sit down, sit down. Look, I'll take up a drink for you. Uh, no time, Locke. What? No time for a drink? Uh, we are in a hurry. What's the matter? Perhaps you had better close the door. Yes, Evans. Yes, sir. Well? I suppose you know the Tsar has been assassinated. Oh, yes, sir. It's hardly news right now. Well, an attempt is being made to reorganize the White Army. What? By whom? There are two Lettish officers here. Zvobodu and an Irishman, Callahan, from the south. Are they a chance? They need money. As usual. The White Army. To fight the revolution. If they win, they'll put Russia back into the war. You'd like that, Locke? Like it. I could ask my government for five million francs. Uh, we thought perhaps uh, you... Uh... No, I have no government funds at my command. You could give Callahan a draft on London. Yes, I could. It's a long chance, of course, but... And very unhealthy if we're caught. Well? Where are these men now, Zabordo and Callahan? They've got a hideout in a garret. We've been using it as headquarters. It's the only place in Moscow that has a keyhole without a spy Zia nestled in it. All right. Take me there. It's the only thing left to do. Fight. Okay. And a revolution starts in Russia. White Army reorganized. Mutiny breaks out in Russian ranks. Mutiny in Russia. Car seeks to suppress new mutiny. Russian secret police hot leaders. You sent for me, Pavlo. Yes, Elena. Sit down here. You're tired? A little. We cannot stop now, you know that. Why did you want to see me? It's about your friend, the Englishman. Oh. You have seen him since he came to Moscow? No. No. Why, Pavlo? We have reason to believe that he's supporting Zvobodu and Callahan. And why are you so sure of that? At any rate, he's being credited with it. And you... you want a scapegoat? We must have sufficient evidence to arrest him. What do you want me to do? Obtain that evidence. If he's arrested now, he will only be deported. Later, he will be shot. You see, you'll be saving his life. Is that an order? It is. I have no choice, then. You are familiar enough with his habits to present yourself to a certain Lettish officer named Callahan. Give him this check. Tell him it's from Locke. Demand a receipt in full for all monies paid to Callahan by Locke so far. 
If the receipt is over, the amount of the check, it will prove that Locke has contributed other money. Your knowledge of Locke and the gift of the check should be sufficient to convince Callahan that you're an accomplice of Locke's, and you will have the evidence. I hope you are wrong, Pavlov. But if you are not, you will have it. Tonight? No, no. Tomorrow morning. <laughs> Bovadil, have you got it? Who's it from, man? Message from Kramalov. You better decode it, Locke. Let me see it. What does it say? Quick. Wait a minute. Well? Kramalov's failed. The mutiny's been suppressed in Kiev. That's nice. That makes everything just fine, doesn't it? Our last hope is that Tito Dovell has been able to find Zabordo. He's holding the cadets in line. Oh, uh, if he doesn't, there's only one place we'll find this little rebellion. And that's up the flu. That's Lenin. He's the brains of the government. If he'd only make one mistake, relax his grip for 24 hours, the whole government would go to pieces. Yeah. And a nice earthquake with a tidal wave would help, too, if you want to talk in terms of long shots. <laughs> oh, it's Tito. Open the door. Ah, come I, I ran all the way from the station. Well, did you find Zabordo? Yes. Dead. What? Dead. Our last chance. Now what do we do? I don't know. I don't know. You'd better get some sleep, Locke. You're on the verge of talking to yourself. Yes, I'll get along. Back to my rooms. Sure. <laughs> you know, there's an old American proverb. When you're behind the eight ball, there's nothing to do but sit there and wait for the break. Go ahead, Locke. <laughs> Who's that? Elena. Is it you? I have been waiting for you. Elena, I wanted you to be here, too. I need you. Oh, do not say that. Don't. It's true. Everything else has gone to pieces. You're the only thing that's left to me. Oh, stop, Stefan. You don't know what you're saying. Oh, yes, I do. I've made a mess of everything, Elena. England backed the wrong horse, all right, when she gave me this job. <laughs> I need a lot of cheering up this time. I have not come to cheer you, Stefan. I cannot do that, ever. You are here, darling. That's all I ask. If only you could understand that a woman can love a man yet fight against him. What? You have always put your country before everything, have you not? Well, so have I. Go on. This morning I... I pretended to be your agent. Go on. The Chakar wanted evidence on which to arrest you. And you volunteered to get it? And they told me if you were arrested now that you'd only be deported, but that later you would be shot. I see. Well? There is a man named Callahan to whom you gave a promissory note on London. I persuaded him to let me have it. Oh. Yes? But don't you see? It was to save your life have you as well. Have given this evidence of the Chikar? No, not yet. Really? Well, that's a pity. Because now you've lost the chance. You've been pretty clever, Elena. But you're going to be cheated of the praise that was coming to you. You wanted it both ways, didn't you? The gratitude of the state and my admiration for patriotism that made you able to betray someone you pretended to love. Well, it's not going to work out like that. What are you going to do? I'm locking the door. The country may have no further use for me, but I'm not cashing in without a struggle. I'm sorry to upset your plans with the Chikar, but the inside of a prison doesn't appeal to me. So you're staying here for as long as it suits me to keep you. And if I said that I wanted to stay? What do you mean? If I wanted to stay here with you. How long? As long as it suits you to keep me. For life. Give up everything? If you would. I, I'm out of the game. That's easy. But with you, it's different. Elena, we could leave Russia together. Together? I would not have believed that together was the loveliest word in the world. Lenya. I love you, darling. I love you, Stefan. I thought everything in my life was over and done with. Now I find that it's only just beginning. Have you ever been in England, Elena? I spent a summer in Sussex. Well, one day we'll have a house in Sussex. And in the morning, when the world's waking up, we'll go out through the wet grass and... See the motherly old downs heaving themselves out of the mist. 
There'll be no more rumble of those guns from the Western Front, just... just the sound of a morning breeze stirring in the pines. I'll hold your hand, then, and say... forever, Elena. Defoe, what is that noise? Sounds like a crowd. Open the window. Why, it is a crowd. Look at them. They're filling the whole square. Something has happened. Step out of the door. Stay where you are. I'll answer it. Who is it? Uncle Nock, it's Tito and Madil. Tito, Madil, what's the matter? Close that door. What's the matter? What's happened? Plenty. Lenin's just been shot. He is dying. Lenin shot? When did this happen? Half an hour ago. You see what it means? With Lenin out of it, we still have a chance. A chance? Where's Lafarge? Quick, on to find Callahan. If we can rally the outlying districts, Defoe. we might pull through. Defoe. It's worth a try anyway. What are you going to do? Oh, it's all right, Elena. You're going to fight. You're going to start all over again. It's my duty. But what of us? Our life together. We were going to England. But I can't go now, darling. Not right away. I see. Then it meant nothing to you. I mean nothing to but you. Please, Elena, I can't expect you to understand this, but... It's a chance again. It's a chance to help England. A chance for more murder and bloodshed. That is what you mean. That's what you want. Oh, haven't there been enough of that already? Haven't enough men died because of you? Darling, Elena... You're to blame for all this. You, with your petty plans and your filthy little schemes. Well, go on. Pass out your guns. You haven't murdered enough men yet. Shoot them down. Shoot them all down. But do not expect me to stand by watching. Elena, come back Let here. You. Come back. Pause for station identification. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. Before Errol Flynn and Francis Farmer continue our play, we hear from a woman who served for several years as a British agent at the very scene of tonight's story. She is Natalie Bucknall, head of the research department of Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer. Last year, Mrs. Bucknall spoke to us for, on film research. Tonight, it's about her thrilling war experiences. Decorated by the Tsar for heroism as a nurse, she later joined the famous 2nd Women's Battalion of Death, marrying Lieutenant Commander George Bucknall, an English naval officer stationed in St. Petersburg. She became a British subject. But like the hero of our play... Mrs. Bucknall was not officially connected with the British government. Ladies and gentlemen, Natalie Bucknall. What I'd like to say, first of all, Mr. DeMille, concerns neither spying nor research. Merely as one of the countless women who must feel the same as I do, I want to thank the sponsors of this program for a product which saves us women so much time and money. Lux Flake. Now for undercover experiences. That took place nearly 20 years ago, at the time of war. And I sincerely trust no one will interpret my remark as a reflection against the nation for which I have every respect. Tell us, Mrs. Bucknall, how did you become a secret agent? It was at the time the Bolsheviks raided the British embassy in St. Petersburg, August 1918. A few months after they had made their separate peace with Germany. I was alone in a room when Captain Cromie, a British intelligence officer, dashed in, followed by the raider. He was shot before my eyes and died in my arms. Then the rest of us, about ten Englishmen and five Americans and Frenchmen, were seized by the Chica and imprisoned in Peter and Paul Fortress. Now, did you escape or obtain your release? I didn't escape, Mr. DeMille. I was released after two days. They thought... But by letting me go, they could follow me, find out where we kept our funds, and intercept any communications that might come from England. Rather an uncomfortable position. What did you do? It may surprise you to learn that I went at once to the German chargé d'affaires. He may have been an enemy, but he also was a gentleman. Through him, I was able to get word back to England. But what about your companions imprisoned in the fortress of Peter and Paul? I managed to establish contact with them by eluding my pursuers and disguising myself sometimes as a peasant, sometimes as a servant girl or a nurse. By bribing first the guard and then a woman cook, I was able to get inside the prison several times. 
The cook admitted me in exchange for a pair of fashionable high-level boots. Through her, the messages reached the prisoners. I knew that the more ingenious methods of concealment were the ones most likely to be found out. So I used the simplest. And my most successful rule was to hide messages in cans of French sardines. After six weeks, the Bolsheviks decided to release our men if England would also release the group of Russian officials imprisoned in London. This was arranged and the exchange negotiated in Sweden. But it wasn't until more than two years after the killing of Captain Cromie that England sent an official representative again to Russia. I presume it was for this work, Mrs. Bucknall, that you were awarded the Order of the British Empire. Partly for that, perhaps, and partly for what I was able to do when my husband and I returned a few months later to the south of Russia. He was then the British Naval Liaison Officer attached to General Denikin's staff. It was my job, again unofficial, to remain at headquarters and convey the news to him at the front. I also was in charge of a military hospital. Looking back at these experiences, Mr. DeMille, they seem uh, like a nightmare. Yet many of the things I learned during the war are very helpful to me in dealing with the problems of research that arise in our pictures at Metro Golden Mile. And now, let's listen again to the play. Very thrilling, Mrs. Buckner. Errol Flynn and Francis Farmer resume the story of British Agent. With Lennon between life and death, mob hysteria rises to fever heat. Blame for the shooting has been laid to Stephen Locke and his friends, and the net of the jacquard tightens slowly about them. In the Garrett Hideaway, their storehouse for guns and ammunition, Stephen and Madill work doggedly far into the night. In the flickering light of a candle, they check a list of their forces. Lundrovich, 20 men. Send him 10 more rifles, 200 rounds of ammunition. Right. Next customer. Petrovich, 40 men. Miss Lafarge. Come in, Lafarge. Any news? Yes. I have news. What's the matter? Delval is dead. What? Dead. They shot him an hour ago. God, why did it have to be him? Well, I'm going to try to get through to General Stefanovich. He has the strongest counter-revolutionary forces in action. I need 500 rubles, Stephen. Right, here you are. Oh, by the way, you fellows, I hear the Sheka has a list of all counter-revolutionaries. <laughs> we are featured. <laughs> Allo, au revoir. Bon revoir. Ciao. So long, Lafarge. All right, let's get on, Manu. Who's the last one? Petrovich. 40 men. 30 rifles, 400 rounds. Androvich, 10 men. 10 rifles, 100 rounds. Koskov, 15. 10 rifles. What's that? Machine gun. Get away from that window. They got Lafarge. He's down there. He's lying in the street. He's dead. Tell Val. Now Lafarge. Go. They got him. Killed him. The dirty rifle. Easy, man. They killed him. Put down that gun. I'll show them. Put it down. Can't shoot, you fool. They'll locate the rifles, ammunition, everything. <sighs> Sorry, Locke. Lost my head. Hand me my coat, will you? Where are you going? Look up a friend of mine. Who? General Stepanovich. Don't be a fool. You'll never get through. Don't worry. I'll get through. How? I've got to think that up on the way. Pavlov speaking. What? Where'd you pick him up? Hold him, of course. They won't, eh? We'll see. Well, they've just arrested Medill. Oh, Medill. On his way to meet Stefanovich. You know him, Elena? Yes, yes, I know him. Oh. He refuses to talk as yet. We shall have to make him talk. What can he tell you? He's the only one left who knows where Stephen Locke is hiding. That's why I gave orders not to shoot him. We must find Stephen Locke. But why, Pavlov? Why is it necessary to hunt down one lone man when there are so many? Because our government is teetering. If Lenin dies and if these riots continue, it will fall. These riots must be stopped. Locke is one of the sources. and he must be found. We can no longer think in terms of the present or of ourselves, Elena. Love is of small concern now. I want you to go and see Matel in his cell. He knows you love Locke. 
gain his confidence. Find out where Locke is hiding. No. You refuse? Oh, haven't I done enough? None of us have done enough. But I love him. I love him. You will go, do you hear? No, please. You will go. Come, Tom. Oh. Hello, Elena. I... I am sorry you're here, my dear. Merely a stopover. I'm leaving tomorrow. You... You are to be shot in the morning? It was mentioned in my conversation with the Chaka. Locke, where is he? I'll tell you tomorrow, at noon. Oh, if, if only I could reach him. You were rather fond of him, weren't you? I love him. You know, there used to be four of us. It wasn't bad then, we could play poker. But now with the rest of us, almost gone, there's nothing for Locke to do but play solitaire. He's playing a lone hand now. He can't win. If he could only get out of the country. But how could he? I... I might... You might... what? I could get him out. You didn't come here as a spy, did you? No woman could be that rotten, could she? No. All right, then. I'll tell you where he is. Go to number 11, Lubyanka. It's a garret over two vacant stores. You knock three... Go on, go on. You told you more than that. It is Garrett over two vacant stores. Knock three and two on the door to the left. Ah, good work, Elena. I'll send a squad. Oh, he isn't there now. He will not be until nine o'clock. Okay, it's eight now. Oh, but the place is filled with ammunitions. He could kill 20 men before they reach the stairs. Then the only way is to blow it up. Blow it up? A time bomb should do the trick. We'll plant it early, give everyone a chance to stand clear. What? At what time? We'll play safe. We'll set a bomb for 10 o'clock tonight. He's sure to be there. Oh, he will be there. At least, he'll never know. No. He will never know. out there. Who's at that door? Answer or I'll shoot. Who is it? Hey. Before. Why are you here? I wanted to be with you. I see. Did you come in the line of duty? No, no, Stefan. I have done my duty. It is finished. It is just you and I now. Listen, dear. Listen to me. It is nine o'clock. In an hour, you and I, we, we are going away together. What? It is all arranged. Your work is done. So is mine. But how? I'll never get past that door, darling. They shoot me on sight, you know that? Do not worry, darling. We have an hour to tell each other how happy we are going to be. A whole hour to love each other. What time is it? Three minutes of ten, darling. Why? Oh, it, it seems to have gone so quickly. Darling, is there anything wrong? Something you haven't told Oh, me? no, no, darling. Stefan, kiss me. Hold me tight. Tell me you love me. Oh, tell me. Tell me, Stefan. Oh, darling, I love you. I love you, Elaine. Listen. It's bells. Why, I wonder? I, I do not know. The crowd, they're yelling something. At... Did you hear? It's something about. It's about Lenin. Lenin lives! Lenin lives! Stop the terror! Lenin lives! He's going to recover. Then it is peace. The terror is over, Ostefan. What's it mean? Oh, it means we are free. They will empty the prison. Then Madil's safe. And we are, darling. We can go to England. Oh, God. What? No, get out of here, Stefan. We have got to get out of here. Unlock the door. But why? Don't stop now. Please, please, Stefan. Open the door. Oh, quickly. 
Lenny, are you mad? Get down the stairs, out in the street. Hurry, Stavon. What's all this about? We have got to get away from here, out into the street. Give me a hand. Here we are. Look, out that way. Oh, stay near me, Stavon. Stay near me. Do not leave me. <laughs> it's all right, darling. We're out now. Lenny, will you please tell me what you're doing? Lenya. Are you all right, Stefan? Yes, darling. You knew what was going to happen. Yes, but but that is over now, Stefan. We are free to go. Our life is beginning again. You knew what was going to happen, and you stayed with me. That was my duty, too. Errol Flynn and Francis Farmer rejoin us later. If you saw such hit pictures as David Copperfield, Libel's Lady, The Thin Man, A Tale of Two Cities, and The Good Earth, you've seen on the screen the name of tonight's guest, one of the world's most famous exceptions, the rule that it takes a man to make clothes for women. She's a native of England and established her reputation in the stage and productions throughout Europe, then in New York, and finally in Hollywood. Now at Metro Goldwyn Mayer Studios, she creates styles for stars like Myrna Loy, Virginia Bruce, Louise Reiner, Maureen O'Sullivan. Ladies and gentlemen, Miss Dolly Tree. Thanks, Mr. DeMille. I could begin to talk now about nothing but Lux Flakes and still not have time enough to say half what I'd like to about your wonderful product. That's very nice. So we want to hear something about clothes, too. But you go ahead, and I'll interrupt you when I think it's time to change the subject. Fine. The outstanding quality I found in Lux is the feeling of utter cleanliness that it gives to clothes. It leaves them with a freshness no other soap seems to impart. Our wardrobe department at MGM uses Lux flakes constantly, just as they do at every other major studio. What I've discovered personally is how good they are for silk stockings and woolens. It keeps a woolen sweater, for instance, just as soft, fleecy and elastic as when it was brand new. I've also found out that women have such faith in Lux that they don't work so hard when laundering a garment. And because of this fact, that you don't have to use so much effort with Lux, your clothes don't lose their shape. Lux means less work and a better job. Thank you, Miss Tree. But what about the clothes themselves? What makes a woman well-dressed? An ability to select simple clothes of good quality with the thought that the most important thing is not her wardrobe but herself. What I mean is that clothes should emphasize the woman first and then the style. Now, do clothes make the woman, or does the woman make the clothes? <laughs> well, everybody has some one good point to emphasize. If a girl has lovely feet and legs, she should spend most of her money on shoes and stockings. If her hands are particularly nice, it's smart to attract attention to them by wearing conservative jewelry and keeping her fingers well-groomed. If she has lovely teeth, let her wear a collar or a necklace that will direct the eye to her smile. Don't pay any attention to styles unless you're comfortable in them. Wear the kind of clothes in which you'll feel the best. Then you'll look your best. Has the coronation been as important an event in the realm of clothes as it has been to history? The coronation hasn't affected clothes a great deal, Mr. DeMille. Though the Duke of Windsor and the former Mrs. Simpson have created some style trends. The Duke's stay in Austria has started a vogue for short Tyrolean sweaters made of thick, heavy wool, while one of the popular new colors, a sort of hyacinth shade, is known as Wallace Blue. Well, apart from colors and styles, Miss Tree, have there, have there been any really new ideas in clothes recently? Well, we're popularizing a new type of fabric, Mr. DeMille, called hand-painted muslin. This material is like a stiff chiffon with the design painted on by hand. For those who can afford it, hand-painted muslin assures absolute individuality in gowns without a chance of them being copied. But what about those who can't afford to gild the lily in that fashion? Well, if your income is limited, don't buy many clothes, but get good ones. If you want an example of what the right clothes can do, pay attention to Una Merkel in Saratoga. For the first time, Una has the opportunity of playing a glamorous ro role. Working with such a lovely girl as Una... My job was really easy, but it proves what clothes can do in creating a new personality. 
On behalf of the ladies, thank you, Miss Creed. A checkup of our stars since their last appearance in the Lux Radio Theater shows that Errol Flynn, after spending several weeks at the battlefronts of Spain, has returned to the comparative calm of Warner Brothers Studio, where he's just completed a new film with Kay Francis called uh, Libeled Lady, called Another Dawn. But, uh, while Francis Dawn, has, while Francis Palmer, has made the toast of New York for RKO and has just begun to get our feet wet in Ebb Tide, another Paramount picture. Are my facts straight, Francis? Yes, <laughs> Straighter Mr. than my tongue, I hope. <laughs> <laughs> but they're not detailed enough. What about that trip you took to Spain, Mr. Flynn? Well, I don't think I quite realized what it was going to be like. Anyway, I know now what it is to hear shells exploding over your head and machine gun bullets whining past. Believe me, it's pretty frightening. But of all the horrible things I saw down there, I was convinced of one thing, and that is that the only cause in the world today worth fighting for, and that every man and woman should fight for, is the cause of peace. Don't I recall reading in the newspapers that you were wounded over there? Well, I wasn't actually wounded, and it's a thing I haven't liked to talk about much. I tried to laugh it off by calling it a bump on the head, but it was a bit more serious than that. What happened was that a large caliber shell burst about 50 yards away from me on the Madrid front. I was hit on the head by some falling debris and suffered concussion for several days. But suppose I do a little cross-examining. What's this I hear, Francis, about your going east this summer to do a play? Oh, yes, sir. Well, it's just that I want to work in summer stock. I feel I need as much stage work as I can get. And incidentally, I think that one reason why picture people like being on this program so much, Mr. DeMille, is because it's the next best thing to being on the legitimate stage again. To all of you, my sincere thanks. Goodbye, Mr. DeMille. Goodbye, Errol. Goodbye, Francis. Thank you, Miss Palmer and Mr. Flynn. Ladies and gentlemen, this is your announcer, Melville Roig. A brilliant production has been arranged for your entertainment next Monday night and will be told in a moment by Mr. DeMille. Our stars this evening were assisted by Colin Campbell as Evans, C. Montague Shaw as Sir Walter Carrister, Don Terry as Medill, Joseph Kearns as Lafarge, Cy Kendall as Pavlov, Frank Nelson as Tito Del Valle, Lee Millar as Commissioner, Lou Merrill as Mr. X, John Lake as Dimitri, James Eagles as Peter, and Ross Forrester as the newsboy. Mr. DeMille and Miss Farmer appeared through courtesy of Paramount Studios. Mr. Flynn, Warner Brothers, and Louis Silver's 20th Century Fox, where he was in charge of music for the new film, This Is My Affair. If you haven't yet put your blankets away, plan to lux them the first bright day that is also fresh and windy. Lux won't shrink woolen. Blankets stay warmer, cared for the lux way. You see, the warmth of a blanket depends very largely upon the amount of nap. When a blanket shrinks and mats in washing, it loses its fluffy nap. Then it won't keep you warm. In Farmer's Bulletin number 1497, the government warns against rubbing, heat, and harmful alkali. You avoid all these washing blankets the lux way. It keeps them soft and fluffy. It's so thrifty, too. News now from our producer. Twice produced on the Broadway stage, twice in motion pictures. Our play for next Monday night is destined, I think, to rank as one of the most dramatic stories ever presented in the Lux Radio Theater. Madam X. Hollywood has few more convincing emotional actresses than the one who comes to our stage in the title role, Anne Harding. And starring with Miss Harding, James Stewart. <laughs> Our sponsors, the makers of Lux Flakes, join me in inviting you to be with us again next Monday night when the Lux Radio Theater presents Anne Harding in Madam X with James Stewart. A few hours ago, Miss Jean Harlow was graduated by death to whatever the next stage may be. The screen has lost one of its most brilliant personalities. And we who knew her, a kind and gentle friend. Hollywood tonight holds many heavy hearts. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System.